That was a commanding performance by Eddie and Ketty. And when I say commanding, I mean against a team at the bottom of the table. Sure. But does that change the quality of the goals that the guys scored? Two of those goals, if not all of them, obviously, were top quality goals. And Arsenal scored good goals throughout the game. They made chance after chance after chance, and they put Sheffield United to the sword. David Raya probably could have been, I don't want to say an outfield player, but was a goalkeeper really worth it today? Honestly, the amount of control that Arsenal had, and I get it, like due to uh, the play, the teams being bottom of the table, you meant to beat those teams quite convincingly. But the quality of the goals from Eddie Nketiah, I know I've said this once, but I'll say it again. I think Eddie Nketiah has been one of those players that's been misjudged purely because we've seen such high profile players as Gabriel Jesus, Bakayo Saka, Gabriel Martinelli, and beyond that, just get in the press. Like there are so many big personalities in this side that, if you don't hear about them all, or if you only see like a, you know, you're not going to get the front cover of the magazine if you're Eddie and Ketia. You're going to get the front cover of the magazine if you're one of the other players who starts regularly and is seen as one of those kind of key Arsenal players. But as Gabriel Jesus puts in that commanding performance in Europe, we then see the same happening from Eddie and Ketia, especially after a good profile, I'd say, that I did earlier in the week in Gabriel Jesus, talking about the importance he has within the team. If you set up your team... And this was a different setup to if Arsenal had started, say, Odegaard in this game. And I get it, Emil smith is still a 10 or still a playmaker, but very different into the way that Odegaard does it. Slightly more driving, slightly more direct in a very different way. Maybe a little less enabling of the wing players, but still a really good player. He's, you know, it's, it's almost not an evaluation of him to, to say he's not Odegaard. Well, in fact, it's not an evaluation, but you get what I mean. Like, his... A lot of people want to say, oh, because we've got Odegaard, we don't need Emil Smith-Rowe, or where does Emil Smith-Rowe really fit in this team? Well, you can see where he fits by enabling people like Eddie and Ketia. But go with me here, right? If you want to talk about that little touch, takes it into his body, puts it, puts it into the net. You want to talk about the long strike. You want to talk about the way that he handled the penalty that Arsenal had to wait ages for. Who's the guy who's handling the ball at the time? Already got the hat trick. Eddie and Ketia ball in his arms. He's got other players around him, just mingling, waiting for the ball, possibly. A couple of players going, hey, can I get it? Havertz at that point thinking, maybe I should be the guy to take it. Arsenal having scored all five penalties, by the way, this season, two of which have been him, two of which have been Saka, and one of which has been, I think, Kai Havertz at this point. So the point being, though, when he then hands the ball off to who is going to take it, you think, okay, there's something else here that we haven't really profiled, that we haven't really seen. And that is the element of leadership, the element of being the dog in the team, the guy that people look at and go, oh, you are a leader. You are some someone who runs a dressing room. You're part of running a dressing room. Personalities that people really genuinely pick on at Arsenal and say, that guy isn't that. I did a profile, of course, of Chelsea earlier on this season. And we were talking about how many leaders are within this side. And sometimes leaders aren't always as outwardly evident as they are within the team. The dynamics of a side is really important. And Eddie Nketiah has always added to that. But what I loved today was the directness of his play. What I loved was he wasn't even, if you look at those heat maps, the first, uh, the furthest forward player. They still allowed Gabriel Martinelli and Saka to get those touches on. They still allowed the interplay with Nketiah. Nketiah is still coming deep and getting that ball. You've got Emil Smith-Rowe still getting that ball. You've got Kai Havertz when he comes on doing what he needs to do. Like, it's... Good to see Mikel Arteta flexing every now and again. And I think what people miss about games like this is the importance of building momentum, the importance of building confidence, the importance of just saying, this is a real game, go out there and perform in it. People only really talk about Arsenal in those big moments. And I get it. Like last season, there were a couple of big moments where it was like, oh, could they have just gotten over the line? But you don't get at all anywhere near those if you don't have these moments now, right? These moments where you basically go, right, are we actually going to play our Arsenal football here? Or are we just going to wait for the big games? Now, that means that North London basically dominates the top of the Premier League table until tomorrow. But there is something going on here. Like, there is something going on with Mikel Arteta and Arsenal's rivalry with Spurs could possibly push them a little bit further this season. I get the feeling that Arsenal just think, if we just stick in it here, if we just, as long as we're keeping pace with Spurs... In the end, Spurs will drop away and we will push forward. Obviously, Man City will be there as well. But after that win against City, after people are beginning to pick away at the City tactics, I think you feel like Arsenal might actually be in pole position for this Premier League right now. I know it's a weird thing to say, but 
Spurs obviously don't have that experience. Arsenal didn't have that experience last season. Maybe Ange Postacoglu has that experience. Maybe Ange is going to be the guy who says, hey, we're going... It seems so far as if it's like we're just going into the unknown. There's a weird confidence of going into the unknown that Arsenal didn't really have at one point. Because it felt... Well, it wasn't the unknown for them, was it? That's what's weird about this. This Spurs team don't really have this experience. So it's all new. It's all magical for them. This Arsenal side, they're not jaded. But you know that there's trauma scars there with the Arsenal fan base sort of going right you know yeah we know we can win this we know we've got a capable side but will we win this Spurs don't really have that they're just kind of enjoying being in the experience at this point of course if you look back at that back line it wasn't really challenged at all so of course they could put Eddie and Ketty forward but again like if you've got Ben White in the field, if you've got Zinchenko dropping into midfield, if you have your two main centre-backs and Riot is barely even challenged, it's a great training session. It's really good to watch them use the structure of their midfield in a different way to the way they normally use it with Odegaard. The way that Rice was interchanging with other players. The way that Rice didn't really even need to be in this game in the end, but he ran it in a different way to the way that Odegaard would. I really also enjoyed the fact that when you see people like Saka just pushing on. When you see Martinelli, almost constantly when you're watching the commentary, his name is mentioned because he has so many touches of the ball. There's so many times where they want to work it wide and then work it back in. People don't seem to appreciate what Gabriel Martinelli does for this team. They don't seem to appreciate that there is a set, an element of self-sacrifice that we don't always get the opportunity to hero because there's so many other headlines around Arsenal. And I love this tweet from TDK or Alex from TDK. And he basically said, uh, so Sheffield have obviously got this idea of we're going to suppress Arsenal, suppress Arsenal, makes it an annoying game. It was about half an hour in at this point and there was a stoppage. And he tweeted, don't give Mikel Arteta any stoppages to let Arsenal make changes. Little tweaks that Mikel Arteta can get into the game with. Little tweaks that make a massive difference just minutes later and Eddie Nketiah is getting his first goal. It's easy for people to say, oh, Eddie Nketiah is not Gabriel Jesus. It's easier for him to say he's not in the shape of X, Y, Z, this kind of player. It's easy for them to say, but he's not the kind of player who's Harry Kane. Well, he just struck a ball, well, almost as well as Harry Kane. Harry Kane had that amazing Bundesliga strike, but in the Bundesliga. But while we're talking about all of these fringe, in inverted commas, players, let's also give some credit to the other goal scorers within the game. Yeah, Fabio Vieira, nice to see again, an invested fringe player. Nice to see Arsenal field invested fringe players. Nice to see them, I mean, Fabio Vieira is not fringe, but you get my point, like he's not the guaranteed starter, so he's still invested in it. Nice to see Tommy Asu getting his first goal since, what was it, 2021? Not even scored yet in this league? Good to see that as well. But also the adaptability of Tommy Asu. Like Tommy Asu was playing left back just the other day, comes on today, playing right back. That was the rotation that we loved to see towards the end of last season and part of the rotation that was taken away when there was an injury within the team and they could no longer do that. Tommy Asu comes on and gets the goal. Good for him, good for Arsenal, but also good to see that Mikel Arteta is just making these easy changes, getting everyone getting minutes in their legs, getting everyone invested within that. It's also, by the way, good to see that you can start a game with essentially five attackers in that midfield and all of them basically almost perfectly keep their shape throughout the game. Like, do you realise how difficult it is if you're Kai Havertz and you are basically a number nine for a very long time and then you're suddenly asked to play an eight or a six? No, he's never asked to play six, but like a very defensive eight to back up Baki Bakayo Saka, to sit just in front of Ben White, to give the width, to enable the likes of Eddie Nketiah, probably in the position exactly that you want to play, to do his role. Do you realise the level of investment that that takes from any Premier League player and how difficult that can be for a manager to get a player to do? For them to have left aside, for them to be one of the headline players or one of the maligned but headline players and then come into Arsenal and play all these multiple different roles, I just think Kai Havertz isn't getting enough credit right now and I don't think that uh, Arteta is getting enough credit for the level of coaching that he's displaying at the moment. It doesn't make any sense to me why people are like, someone tweeted it, it was something like if... If today's performance was Alvarez, people would be going crazy over it from Eddie and Ketia. If today's performance was, you know, a young player from somewhere else, uh, Man City or Liverpool, Kai Havertz would be getting loads of credit. But he isn't right now. And I just feel like a lot of the time it's assumed right now that Arsenal will be one of the top performers. And I get it. Like, you know, that is a valid thing. Like, you know, you should be able to do that. 
But at the same time, give Arsenal their credit. Give Mikel Arteta the credit that he deserves. Because right now that guy's probably out, probably outside of, but probably also just slightly ahead of Ange Postacoglu in terms of coaching within the league. We're looking at the best coach in the league right now, at least in terms of form, at least in terms of what he's doing, right? So give him that credit. I'm just saying, it's worth it. Even if it is against sides where it's like, yeah, you're meant to. You're supposed to. And now I'll save it, like, the best for last almost. I want to talk about Jakob Kivior. Like, he didn't very... Well, he didn't really have anything to do today. There's not really very much for him to do in the first place. But keeping your goalkeeper safe in the first place, playing as part of a system like this, absolutely destroying the opposition, is huge for that. He's not a first-choice centre-back, but he is one of the level of a first-choice centre-back for a lot of Premier League teams right now. So... I just want to talk about the ability to be able to rotate your centre-backs, which is something that a lot of modern managers now seem to need to be able to do in the Premier League. Last season, that wasn't really possible for Mikel Arteta, just because he needed a solid pairing. And I get it, like, you know, it's important, obviously, to have confidence throughout the side, but very often you will have a preferred centre-back pairing. Kivior, though, is one of those players who, any time he comes in, I think to myself, wow, that guy should be playing more often. He should be playing left-back, should be playing right-back, should be playing centre-back, probably more left-back. But you get my point, like, there is a player there in Mikel Arteta's squad who basically would be a starter for 75% of the other Premier League sides. And at the moment, he's sitting behind probably two of the best centre-backs in the world at the moment, at least in most people's lists. So, again, credit to those fringe players for doing something that is very difficult to do. And I'd imagine at this point in the season, obviously they're not, you know, deep into the season. They, won't, they don't know how many minutes left to come. But at this point in the season, they'll be thinking, there's a couple of guys within this team that can challenge the starters to be, like, to actually be a serious challenger, not just a backup. And that is exactly what Arsenal will want to see. With people out, such as Gary Jesus, and other people, such as Kivior, pushing their centre-back partner. I'd be interested to know what you guys think. I'd love to know about your insight on Mikel Arteta, what you, how you think he approaches these kind of games. The penalty for me was definitely a penalty. I think it was also a penalty that was really reckless. I would wonder whether there was a red card in that because it was whatever the position he tackled him in and where he tackled him. I personally think... Uh, you know, I want to hear your comments in the comments below. Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you guys in the next video. Obviously, two videos coming tomorrow. One on my Liverpool channel, one on this channel. See you guys later. Much love. Bye.